Welcome to the 700 Club. Israel's military is making major gains as it pushes deeper into Gaza City. The IDF captured a key Hamas terrorist base, which used to plan the deadly October 7th massacre. For the first time since the war began, Israel has now agreed to limited humanitarian pauses. Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Fox News that the pauses that the White House announced will be limited and only in different neighborhoods so that civilians can get away. But he again made clear there will be no ceasefire until all the hostages are released. No, the, the fighting continues against the Hamas enemy, the Hamas terrorists, but in specific locations for a given period of a few hours here, a few hours there, we want to facilitate a safe passage of civilians away from the zone of fighting. So far, thousands of Gazans have been able to flee the fighting in the north to safer areas in the south. Netanyahu also said Israel doesn't have a timetable for its prosecution of the war. I've set goals. I didn't set a timetable because, you know, it can take uh, more time. I wish it'll take little time. But we're proceeding step by step, uh, reducing our casualties in the process, trying to reduce and minimize civilian casualties and maximize the casualties of the Hamas terrorists. And so far, uh, I think it's proceeding well. For the first time, the Israeli Defense Forces chief of staff entered deep into the heart of the Gaza Strip. The Israeli military captured one of Hamas's main bases, which it used to plan and prepare for the October 7th massacre. The IDF showed some of Hamas's facilities and weapons are located next to schools, kindergartens, medical clinics and mosques. And the role of the media has become an issue again. After the media watchdog group posted a photo of freelance photographer Hassan Elisia being kissed by Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar on October 7th. After the expose of freelance journalists on the scene of the massacre who have worked for publications like AP, CNN and The New York Times, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tweeted, these journalists were accomplices in crimes against humanity. Their actions were contrary to professional ethics. The news services said they had no idea of any advanced knowledge of the attacks, and AP and CNN cut ties with him. But Alex Trayman, Jerusalem bureau chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, tells CBN News Hamas uses the mainstream media for its own purposes. For instance, when its Ministry of Health claims so far 10,000 civilians have been killed. Hamas has every incentive to try to inflate the number of civilians that are killed in Gaza to create this uh, appearance of a humanitarian disaster that, that Israel is causing. Trayman says it fits Hamas's media warfare. The information arena is one of the most important battlefields for Hamas in this conflict. Once the Hamas attacks with, with rockets, so Israel is forced to attack back. And when Israel attacks back, well, that's when it all started. Uh, and that's when the civilian death counts start to be counted and reported. Uh, and that uh, this pressure creates a, a lot of diplomatic, uh, you know, delegitimization of the state of Israel. And that is really what Hamas is hoping to achieve. They want the international community to demonize and delegitimize the state of Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, most Palestinians back Hamas in their fighting against Israel, though there's disagreement over just how deep that support is. And it could be crumbling as Israeli forces have hit Gaza hard in their war against terrorism. Dale Hurd has that story. Public protest against Hamas in Gaza are rare. However, this clip from the BBC on social media shows a woman in Gaza cursing the dogs of Hamas for her suffering. Before someone can be seen covering her mouth. There are Palestinians in Gaza who don't support Hamas, but polls have shown that most, in fact, do, or at least they did before Hamas brought misery and death to their doors. A project called Whispered in Gaza interviews Palestinians secretly and claims that most do not support Hamas, but says Palestinians are afraid of being killed if they speak out publicly. Corey Gil Schuster, a Canadian Israeli, has also been interviewing Palestinians as well as Israelis for his YouTube channel, The Ask Project. 
and has asked many Palestinians about Hamas. Schuster says every Palestinian he's interviewed on camera has backed Hamas, but he also wonders if they were all telling the truth. I assume that in a lot of the videos, people are answering me thinking, what is the best thing to say that I will be safe? Do they actually believe it if they say harsh things like, yes, we should kill the Jews, we need to expel the Jews? I'm sure, to a certain extent, but uh, it is hard to know how much of that extremism is public pressure. It's impossible to know. Privately, with a few, and a very few, have I heard them say, yes, we have, we have done a lot of damage uh, to ourselves. They tell me this privately, they won't say it publicly. It, it's, it's considered treasonous. They could be killed for it. However, Schuster also does not think most Palestinians are secretly peace-loving. This Palestinian said he favored dropping a nuke on Tel Aviv. And polls have shown solid support for Hamas, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority is in charge. The Palestinian Authority is seen as weaklings, and um, they do nothing um, against the Israelis. They are considered puppets of the Israelis, according to almost all Palestinians. Um, and at least Hamas and Islamic Jihad um, fight the Israelis. And most Palestinians want there to be resistance. They want there to be violent resistance against uh, the Israelis. Samer Mohammed grew up in a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. Now a Christian living in the U.S., Samer says that he, like other Palestinians, was brainwashed to hate Israel and believes the chief problem is Islam. Every Palestinian, he have a goal. And his goal to die for Allah, to die for Palestine. My brother, if you, if you don't have anything to lose, if you are poor, everything darkness, this is the problem. We need to tell them about the Messiah, about Yeshua. Unfortunately, Schuster's extensive interviews with Palestinians have shown him that most support Hamas because they hate Jews and want them to die. And he's not optimistic that that will change anytime soon. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, with us now from Washington, D.C., is Jonathan Schanzer with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. So let's get right to it. Some people say Israel's invasion of Gaza will actually produce more radicals, more people against them. But you think it could make Palestinians and others in the Middle East actually respect Israel. Could you tell us more? Sure. I think, you know, what we have right now is the possibility for a complete and total victory. In other words, the utter vanquishing of Hamas. We've actually not really seen a war of that kind in the Middle East in years. I mean, I would argue that maybe 1991, the Gulf War, was the last time the U.S. has had a total victory in the region. Uh, the Israelis have an opportunity right now to completely defeat Hamas. It will be a game changer. I think it will get the attention of Israel's enemies. And it will get the attention of Israel's allies as well. There's a reason why we've seen normalization take place across the Middle East. A lot of these countries in the region find Israel's strength very attractive. They understand that Israel is the regional power that they need to align with to combat the forces of, say, Iran. So there is an opportunity here, even as dangers lurk, even as we see potential for radicalization, I do think the potential for victory is quite important. Is there a potential for victory in the ideology? I've heard it for decades now, uh, the Palestinians calling for the destruction of Israel. I've heard it for decades coming out of Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the, the current call. It's amazing on the streets of London and, and New York and college campuses from the river to the sea. I know what that means. It means the eradication of Israel and the death of all the Jews living there. Uh, so if, if that's the ideology, even if there's a tremendous military victory, will it change it? Well, look, I think there is value in proving the, the futility of those calls. In other words, this rhetoric is undeniably annihilationist, right? They are calling for the annihilation of a, of a nation of 10 million people. And this nation, rather than uh, dying quietly has decided to stand up against uh, against its enemies. And they're starting with the enemy in the Gaza Strip. But I will say here, I don't think that it ends in Gaza. I think there's actually a good chance, perhaps not in the next month or even the next year, but I think there's a good chance that we see clashes between Israel and Hezbollah 
Israel is going to need to set the record straight here. After years of allowing a number of its enemies to grow, um, they are going to have to start to win against those enemies. I think we're seeing that now. And I think the more winning that takes place on the battlefield, the more that some of these vociferous critics of Israel that are based in capitals all around the Western world, I think they're going to realize the futility of their calls for annihilation. Well, let's talk about the public relations battle. It seems that Hamas was had a, a coordinated PR campaign uh, and trying to get sympathy from Western media. It's amazing to me uh, that publications, uh, even the New York Times, was was fooled by the Gaza Ministry of Health, even though it's it's clear it's a propaganda arm of Hamas. They they planted a false story about bombing a hospital. Uh, their death tolls are, are taken uh, at face value with nobody l looking behind it. So how big of a problem is, is Israel's PR problem? Look, it's a big problem, and I think Hamas has a lot of the sympathy. By the way, I would also attribute this more broadly to the Muslim Brotherhood movement, which Hamas is a splinter of the Muslim Brotherhood. It gets significant support, and this is really one of the largest uh, kind of Islamist uh, activist organizations in the world. There are literally tens of millions of people that are out there advocating for Hamas. And you can absolutely see it penetrate the American media, the Western media. And so this, the coverage is slanted. I do think, though, that there is an opportunity right now for Israel. We do, uh, I think we've got a pretty good grasp on the military situation inside the Gaza Strip, where more than a handful of hospitals inside the Gaza Strip are doubling as military command centers. If Israel can surround these places, not bomb them, but actually uh, you know, uh, stop the tunnels from being operational and then ultimately uh, demand the surrender of the Hamas fighters within, the images that could come from these scenes at various hospitals around the Gaza Strip, I think there is some very important visual evidence to convey right now to the West. I don't think uh, the average American, the average uh, viewer of television in the Western world understands the extent to which Hamas has wielded human shields throughout the Gaza Strip. There is an opportunity, I think, to flip the script, so to speak, and to begin to show the truth of what is happening inside the Gaza Strip. Well, I'm all for flipping the, the script. It's it's incredible. The head of Hamas is, I mean, he's convicted of murdering uh, four Palestinians for, quote, collaboration with Israel. And and you look at you know, how can there ever be peace where, where if you advocate for peace, uh, you, you say, yes, Israel has a right to exist and can we get on with our lives too and, and stop this. Uh, all, all that happens to you is you get executed. Uh, it's it's absolutely incredible, and it's an ideology that has been on perpetrating itself. Let's talk about Israel. Uh, and and it seems like they were deceived by Hamas that somehow Hamas was now uh, looking to build Gaza. Uh, they thought it was Hamas was on the sidelines, um, and at the same time, Hamas was clearly building up forces for a, a horrific attack. So is, is, is this the same with Hezbollah? Is this the same of letting a threat grow while, while you, you think you have it solved? Look, I think, you know, the Israelis clearly had an intelligence collapse as it relates to the 10-7 attack. There was, I think, a, a broad misunderstanding across the intelligence community. There was an assessment that Hamas wanted to um, uh, uh, prevent conflict from reaching the Gaza Strip, that it was trying to export violence to the West Bank, for example, or that the leader of Hamas in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar, was more dedicated to providing services to his people. That was an information operation that the Israelis succumbed to, and they uh, and I think they paid a severe price, and, and we're now watching the war as a result. What is happening in Lebanon is, I think, very different. The Israelis have no illusions about who Hezbollah is and what it is that they plan to achieve. This is an organization that has roughly 10 times the firepower of, uh, of Hamas. Uh, they have precision-guided munitions. They've got drones. They've got an army that has trained alongside Iran and Russia. 
There has been, I think, a steady drumbeat of uh, reports suggesting that conflict could break out at any moment over the last month or so. I think there is still a better than average chance that Israel may need to escalate with Hezbollah. They've been firing something like a dozen or two dozen anti-tank rockets into Israel every day during this conflict since October 8th. So I think the Israelis have no illusions of who they're dealing with, and they've always been focused on the very severe threat coming out of Lebanon. I do have concerns for a multi-front war. I think that's why the U.S. has sent uh, its uh, uh, carrier strike groups to the region. There is an attempt to try to prevent a wider conflagration, which, of course, could be disastrous for Israel, but disastrous also for the rest of the region. So you see the U.S. trying to contain that. I do wonder whether at some point Israel says, hey, you know what, we're already mobilized and, and Hamas is virtually defeated or entirely defeated. We have our army mobilized and perhaps it's time to take the fight to Hezbollah and to end this once and for all. It'll be very interesting to see what happens after a week or two more of fighting in the Gaza Strip. Well, thanks for the insight, Jonathan, and thanks so much for being with us today. As President Biden prepares to meet with Chinese leader Xi Jinping next Wednesday in San Francisco, a new Pentagon report reveals a disturbing development about China's military power. Aside from expanding land, air, and sea capabilities, Beijing's nuclear arsenal is rapidly growing, blowing past previous projections. CBN national security correspondent Caitlin Burke has a story. According to this intelligence, China has more than 500 nuclear warheads in its arsenal as of May. That's 100 more than last year and puts Beijing on pace to field more than 1,000 by 2030. A rapid expansion that has the U.S. taking note. They're becoming a great power. They don't want to be checkmated by our nuclear forces and they want to therefore be in our league. Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution says China still has a ways to go before its stockpile rivals that of the U.S. or Russia. He adds, while the buildup isn't a surprise, he does find the budding partnership between Beijing and Moscow concerning. We always had a framework and we assumed that it was okay for Russia and the United States to each have equal numbers of different types of weapons. And now you have a problem because if China comes into the equation and China and Russia are strategic partners and we let each of the three have the same number of weapons, now it could sort of feel like a two to one, the United States getting you know, uh, outmuscled or outgunned. O'Hanlon says China's military rise will likely require new arms treaties or at least greater transparency. Meanwhile, the Pentagon report also shows a sharp increase in risky behavior by the PRC in the air. In the last two years, we've had as many incidents with the Chinese in the South China Sea and environment as in the previous decade. Between the fall of 2021 and fall of 2023, the DOD documented more than 180 instances of dangerous air intercepts against U.S. aircraft. One of the most recent happening at the end of October when a Chinese fighter flew recklessly close to a U.S. bomber. And the bottom line is that in many cases, this type of operational behavior can cause accidents, and dangerous accidents can lead to inadvertent conflict. This news comes as President Biden prepares to meet with Chinese leader Xi Jinping in California. The two are expected to announce the resumption of military communication channels, a move seen as an attempt to stabilize the relationship between the world's two largest powers and lower the risk of a military misunderstanding. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. All right, thank you, Caitlin. We're well, turning now to the war between Israel and Hamas. Some 250,000 Israelis have evacuated their homes due to fighting at both the southern and northern borders. Many are in hotels not knowing what the future holds. But as CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, despite the trauma and uncertainty, Israelis remain standing strong. Nearly a thousand people are staying here at this resort hotel on the Dead Sea, but they're not on vacation. They were forced to flee their homes in Kibbutz Be'eri after Hamas attacked on October 7th. I was in my safe room. They came into my house. They ruined everything. But I'm still alive and I'm still here. And what the most important thing for us now, for my family now, is to bring my sister and brother-in-law back home. Hamas kidnapped Ham Keen's sister Raz and brother-in-law Ohad Ben-Ami that day, and the family holds out hope for their return. I'm 
very stressed every day. Uh, we don't know anything about their physical condition. So every day is like unknowing what, what to do next. We are just hoping for good news every day. Nir Shani is father of 16-year-old hostage Amit Shani. They entered my house around 9.30. Uh, they broke everything, broke the walls, uh, tried to enter uh, the safe room. I had to struggle with them and they set the house on fire. Uh, my house is burned, but I survived till the army uh, rescued me out around the uh, seven in, in the evening. Amit, his mom and two younger sisters lived at the center of the kibbutz and stayed in touch with Nir for hours during the ordeal. Later on, uh, they told me that uh, seven armed uh, entered the house. They succeed to open the door. They took him out to the grass. They brought a car. They tied the boys with ropes behind their back. One of the terrorists sat by them, and they drove away. 29 of Be'eri's 1,200 members are missing and believed kidnapped into Gaza. Hamas slaughtered another 86 Be'eri residents, including Michal Pinyan's parents, Mati and Amir Weiss. So we got to the safe room on 6.30, but uh, we didn't get out until 1 a.m. While the terrorists couldn't breach Michal's shelter, they took over her parents' home. I think around 9, my mom uh, wrote us that she hears uh, Arabic voices outside her house. A uh, few seconds later, she wrote, they're in my house, they're shouting, they're throwing grenades to blow up the house and the safe room door. And then there was the message of uh, dad got hurt, she was, he was shot. She said what was supposed to be a safe room wasn't. They blew up the safe room door, they took them out, and they, they were found uh, by, the, by the gate of the kibbutz uh, with their hand tied and shot in their head. It's hard for me to, to think that they died in, in this way, in fear, in pain. It took two weeks before Michal and her three siblings could bury their parents. Her youngest brother followed through on his wedding plans for October 30th. It was a happy and sad moment together. So we got a, a funeral and we got a wedding. Founded in 1946 before the State of Israel, the area ended up being one of the hardest hit areas on October 7th. Still, members say the community will survive. And it's obvious that if we want to stay and um keep our uh, country safe, we will have to beat them. I'm full of hope that I will see my son again, and I hope soon. We have a right to defend our country, and people need to understand there is no other way. We have to take Hamas down in order to go home. I will go back to Berry. I will go back. I will go back and I will live there until I die, but I will go back and I will rebuild my home and rebuild my family in where I was born because that's my home. There's no other home for me in the world, anywhere. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Dead Sea, Israel. So many heart-rending accounts. Well, here at home, Christian and Jewish groups in the United States are calling on Israel supporters to rally on behalf of the Jewish state next week right here in the nation's capital at the March for Israel, Tuesday, November 14th. Event organizers say the goals are threefold, calling for the release of the more than 240 hostages held by Hamas, standing against the rise of global anti-Semitism since the October 7th attack, and showing support for the Biden administration and members of Congress who are backing Israel's right to defend itself. For more information on Tuesday's March, all you need to do is visit our website, cbnnews.com. Gordon, back to you. And let me encourage you to attend. Uh, there are many groups that are organizing buses so that people uh, can go to this march. This is a numbers game where we have to counter the number of protesters in the streets of London, the streets of New York, the college campuses. Um, I'm even hearing that in the mid Midwest and in, in, in Cincinnati, there, there are regular pro-Palestinian marches. But we need to turn out in numbers to show people and show the world 
that we care and we stand with Israel. So again, if you want more information about how you can attend, it's November 14th, and you can go to cbnnews.com to get more information. Well, Israelis are under attack near the northern border. Even first responders are being targeted. Still, the people there are getting life-saving medical kits, all because of you. Just five miles from the border to Lebanon, CBN Israel is helping save lives. Thanks to CBN, we got uh, medical equipment and paramedic bags for multiple communities on the border. This is giving life-saving abilities to the few paramedics and response teams here. This area is under such heavy attack, it's difficult for paramedics to get in. The northern border is hot right now. They are shooting rockets at our settlements every day at both military and civilian targets. The Red Shield of David is not allowed in because even the Star of David is a target. Most of the people in this area evacuated. Those still here are part of the first response teams from the communities themselves. Some people stayed because they have fruit orchards or animal farms to take care of. Thanks to your support, Israelis in desperate need of medical care have a chance at survival. This is life-saving gear in these bags, intubation kits, oxygen, life-saving medicine, and other paramedic equipment. These kits were designed to save lives and keep people stable until medical units and rescue forces arrive. They are really needed since medical teams cannot enter. These kits are all we have to save lives. If you want to be a part of helping Israel in her time of need, all you have to do is give to CBN Israel. It's a designated fund, and your gift will go into this relief effort. Whether it's providing medical kits in, in northern Israel or food and water and shelter uh, to the evacuees from southern Israel, uh, we're providing trauma care. It's all being done in your name. So if you want to give, all you have to do is write to us, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Or you can call us and say, I want to give to CBN Israel, 1-800-700-7000. You can also go to CBN.com. There's a way you can designate your gift to CBN Israel. You can also text CBN Israel to 71777. Be a part of it. Stand with Israel and stand today. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Tired of the same old drudgery? You're looking to break out of the boredom? Well, you don't need to wait for things to change. There's a way to start living better than ever beginning today. Author and motivational speaker April Osteen Simons loves bringing inspiration and hope to others through the Word of God. With obstacles and chaos continually surrounding us in this world, April wants to help you overcome everything that life throws your way. In her book, Better Than Ever, April invites you to enjoy every day, finding your purpose, fulfillment, and happiness in God. Well, joining us now is April Osteen Simons, and it's wonderful to have you I'm here today. Honored to be here. Thank you. Bring you bring such a wonderful message in your book, and one that surely we all need to be encouraged by today and the world today. But you say we need to set the standard at the start of each day. Right. We, we get to do that. Yeah, we do. How do we do that? You know, something practical. I'm just really practical. I just like when I get out of bed in the morning, I, I first of all say, God, thank you for another day. Amen. Some people <laughs> didn't get that chance. And then, you know, I, I just declare this is going to be a great day. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may think, you know, you don't know my life story. I don't, but I know that God says, this is a day the Lord has made. Yeah. This is the day. So, you know, there's, there's potential in today. So we have to just kind of take our life back. You know, I like to say life has no remote control. You got to get up and change it yourself. Yeah. It's so a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice yeah. that you make every single day. Well, you mentioned some people might not have yeah. started their day like that. And usually that's because things aren't going well. Right. They're going through something or have gone through something. Yeah. You talk about finding your way in yeah. the book. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I had a little dog. I had to talk about my dog. A little dog, Missy, uh, a little um, Yorkie, beautiful dog. Every day I came home, <laughs> my other dog would come up to the door and he would just bark and be so happy to see me. His tail would wag and 
Missy didn't do a thing. <laughs> and I just have this thing I'm that if, I know. <laughs> if a dog wags his tail, that means they're happy. That's yes. just in my mind. <laughs> so I watched Terry for nine months. My little dog never wagged her tail, and I thought something's wrong with her. And uh, I love my animals. And so I prayed for her. I, I really did pray for my dog. And I came home one day. Trevor came up, my other dog, wagging his tail. And Missy came up and wagged her tail. And I like to say this, Missy had her little breakthrough. <laughs> she found her wag. Yeah. And I equate that to this. Sometimes in life, because it gets so hectic, we go through such hard times. Mm -hmm. And my heart goes out to people who are going through hard times right now. But we have to remember, you know, God has something planned for our life despite what we've gone through, yes. what we're currently going through. We've got to get our wag back. Yeah. We got to, we got to find our purpose again. And, uh, you know, Things happen in life, but God is still on the throne. He still has your best interest at heart. So we just kind of find that purpose again. It needs to be the anchor. In your story, in your book, you talk about a moment that struck you uh, through the years of your mom, who was such an incredible influence on your whole family, literally yeah. standing on the yeah. word of God. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, my mom, she's just my hero. She came home from the hospital, 48 years old. 1981, given a few weeks to live, had metastatic cancer of the liver spread mm -hmm. throughout her body, and they said there's nothing they could do. So I was the only kid at home at the time. I'm the youngest of the clan. I like to say I'm the favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> All and young so, ones yeah, say that. Yeah. <laughs> so mama comes in, and I'll never forget she looked like death. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't explain it, 88 pounds. And I watched as she and my dad walk back to their bedroom very slowly. And I got to witness this. They laid on the ground, put their faces to the ground, and I began to hear my dad pray. Mm. He said, God, I need my wife. The kids need their mom, and Lakewood needs Dodie. So we decree and declared that today, on December 11th, 1981, that she'll live and not die and proclaim the works of the Lord. And I'm, I'm sitting, standing at the bedroom door, and I'm watching all this yeah. as a kid. I'm taking it in. I'm the captive audience. And then I watched my little mom, who had no strength, get up. You know, she's five foot two. I call her the original Polly Pocket. Anyway, <laughs> she took her Bible, she put it on the ground, and she physically stood on it. And she mm. put her hand in the air, and she said, God, her voice got strong. Yeah. The only thing between me and death is your word, and I'm choosing to stand on your wow. word. Wow. Wow. And that and just your impacted mom me. was healed. She was From healed. Cancer. She just had her 90th birthday. We celebrated totally cancer free. It wasn't an overnight miracle, Terry, but it was a miracle. She walked it through. Yeah. faith. She put feet to her faith and she walked it out. Yeah. And uh, man, it just well, changed my life. And often God's using us in the process of all oh, yeah. of that in others who are standing at the door, exactly. watching the walk of faith. Right. And that happened for her doctor. Right. And you're, you got to realize you are a, a impacting and affecting your bloodline. Yeah. What are, what's mama going to do when times get tough? What's yeah. daddy going to do when, you know, he gets that bad doctor's report? Are they still going to love God? Are yeah. they still going to trust God? So I got to witness, you know, what happens when life sends you a curveball. Wow. In our everyday lives, you say that we're missing miracles that are yeah. really right in front of us yeah. to be found. Yeah. How so? You know, sometimes we're looking so much for the big miracle. Yeah. God, bring my kids back. Yeah. God, you know, they're prodigals. And, and, you know, I just say look for the small miracles along the way. Yeah. Just, you know, look for something that you can, that, that's positive in your life. Um, I know someone that was believing for a, a daughter to come back. And yeah. they believed for years and years and years and years and didn't see anything. But they got, they kind of flipped their mindset. A mindset simply means it's mind to set. I'm yes. going to change it around. God's word says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. So she'd send little notes to her daughter and nothing too preachy, you know, nothing mm -hmm. to turn her away. But she noticed that that made her daughter call her. So she, she began to appreciate those small miracles. Hey, I got a phone call. Yeah. I got a phone call. I got a visit. Maybe it's one in three months, but I got a visit. And that turned that whole situation around. And eventually her daughter came back into her life. But it's easy to get focused on she's not here yet. Yes. We got to remember yeah. she's coming in and Jesus' so name. And so often in the Word of God, when God is moving and doing something, there is a long waiting yes. period before we see the end result of God's I, intention. I know. And we don't always like the wait, but you know, God, every next level of your life, God requires a different you. Yeah. So the process sometimes 
begins in us. God needs to weed out a few things in us. So we don't like it, but and it happens. Because you say in the book, one of the <laughs> things we need to do is get out of our own way. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's kind of what you're talking about here. Exactly. Get out of your own way, you know, putting yourself down, yes. you know, comparing yourself to others. Listen, I come from a long line of hope dealers. <laughs> I come from a, a family of preachers. And I remember yes. one day sitting in Lakewood thinking, man, I don't preach like that. I don't I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. And God just spoke to me, April, you know, you, you really do have to get out of your own way. You're not supposed yeah. to be like them. You're supposed to be like who I've yeah. made you to be. So, so often we, do, we sabotage ourselves. Yeah, exactly. We, we need to recognize the bigness of God and who yes. he is in us. Yes. It's a wonderful book. It's an encouraging book. If you're looking for encouragement and inspiration, get April's book. It's called Better Than Ever, and it's available nationwide. So wonderful to have you Thank with you. us. Thank you for bringing you such so an much. encouraging word. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A major blow for Democrats in their bid to keep control of the Senate next year. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announcing he will not seek re-election. What I will be doing is traveling the country and speaking out to see if there is an interest in creating a movement to mobilize the middle and bring Americans together. The Democratic senator stepping away opens the door for Republicans to pick up a seat in the narrowly divided Senate. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping survivors of natural disasters around the world. In Acapulco, Mexico, the devastating Hurricane Otis left flooded homes, buildings, and downed power lines. Jessica and her family lost the roof off their home. While struggling to rebuild, they learned about a community dinner that Operation Blessing set up at the Star of Bethlehem Church. A grateful Jessica also got breakfast, groceries, water, and things for their baby. Thanks to uh, the generous partners of Operation Blessing, uh, Operation Blessing rather, can keep bringing drinking water, food, solar lamps, and hope to the people of Acapulco. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Well, Ben Peterson wanted to join the Army, defend America against terrorists, Yet after seeing the horrors of the battlefield, he started having nightmares. He saw himself as the murderer, the one shedding innocent lives, and he didn't know how to stop. I just remember sobbing and just saying, why? Why is this happening to me? And why did they die? What's it all for? I completely lost my faith. An Iraq war veteran, Ben Peterson grew up wanting nothing more than to become a soldier and make his family proud. It seemed like the only way to find acceptance. Grew up in a family that was pretty out of control. There wasn't the emotional capacity, you know, to share it, that I was isolated, I was alone, I was depressed. I didn't have a lot of friends. And in, and in my house, uh, the greatest thing you could do with your life is serve America in combat. I wanted to gain power and respect, some approval from my dad. Ben's feelings of isolation and powerlessness only worsened in high school when he became a target of intense bullying. But then something changed. One of the school bullies accepted Jesus and began leading other students to Christ. Ben was one of them. He started this Monday night like prayer gathering and I went there, I felt loved, I felt peace, and I gave my life to Jesus. There was still a lot of brokenness there, but the power of God had, had started and planted a seed in me and that seed was starting to grow. At the age of 17, he signed to the Army with the chance to join Special Forces, but he failed the colorblind test. He was given a choice, become an administrative specialist or a chaplain's assistant. And I said, well, which one do I have a better chance of killing terrorists? And they said, well, maybe the chaplain's assistant? He carries a gun, you know, and then they, there's this moment where they just said, are you a Christian? There was just this little something right here, just that little whisper that said, got a calling on your life. And I, I said, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. In 2008, Ben, now 21, deployed to Iraq, eager to serve his country. But his enthusiasm was short-lived as the chaplain woke him on the sixth day of his tour with the words, we had a fallen angel, helicopter down. Seven of our guys are dead. You know, our chaplain probably counseled over a hundred soldiers in the course of 36 hours. And these are, these are aviation units. Guys were guys that have trained for years together this family you lose seven at once 
I, I can't describe the scene of devastation. And the next day, it was like it never even happened. And we got right back to work. That pushed down all the guilt and pain that I was feeling and just locked it up. Really wounded my faith. And that was the beginning of the tour. That was the first week. And it only got worse. So a suicide bomber blew up a school outside of our base one day. Killed, you know, 20, 30 kids, wounded another 40 or 50. Base made the decision to go rescue these kids. I went into the hospital with my chaplain. But there was one little girl with half her face missing. I was just heartbroken. I was just looking at her and time stood still. And then my chaplain came and he got me and said, hey, let's, let's keep going. I wasn't prepared for people to die and I wasn't prepared to see kids with their faces missing. Ben did his best to suppress his feelings, never sharing with anyone. He didn't know the extent of his trauma until his tour ended and he tried to reacclimate to life in the States. I was really upset about the guys that died in combat. There's just that guilt of still being alive. I came home and that's when I just fell apart and I was getting drunk a lot. I had a nightmare that uh, I was murdering children, doing shameful things in your dreams, thinking that's who you are, that it's your fault that those kids got hurt, that you weren't a special forces guy, you were in the background. And all that trauma from being a child was coming up. You know, you want to feel powerful. You want to feel in control. You want to numb. And it was back to the alcohol. Eventually, the pain became too much. Three o'clock in the morning, had a handgun. And I wanted to die. I fell into a puddle of tears in the, in the bedroom and just um, wanted to take my life. Ben stopped at the last moment. Still crying, he picked up his phone and called a friend and Christian mentor, confessing all that he was going through. His advice resonated with Ben. There's a Jesus victory beneath all of your pain. And if you trust him, you're going to have a resurrection day. You're going to know why you went through what you went through. And he's going to work this for good. You know, I looked down at the gun and and said, I don't want to do this. God has a plan for me. Ben then knew he had to rely on God to get his life together in order to fulfill his purpose and honor those soldiers who died. He put down the bottle and picked up his Bible, praying every time he struggled with PTSD. He sought counseling and learned how to be transparent about his emotions and come to terms with his rough childhood. In 2016, he founded Engage Your Destiny, a ministry that teaches active duty soldiers and veterans how to confront their traumas and share with others. And at the core of it all is Jesus Christ. You have to learn to trust him and trusting that he will take the darkest, most awful, vile, horrific things in your past and he will work them for good. God took me when I was an emotionally fragile, weak, powerless human being. And he took me and he loved me. He healed me, mind, body, and spirit. And then he took me with everything that I've learned through all the pain, all the trauma, and said, here's a mission to go help others who are going through the exact same thing. Jesus is the answer. He will always be the answer. He is who's going to radically transform your life. And um, that's what we're seeing right now. You can have that same radically transformed life. You can have what Ben found. All you have to do is ask for it. Now, for Ben, it's a story that I think a lot of people share. There's an underlying trauma. For, for, for Ben, it was multiple ones, whether it was being bullied in childhood, uh, the horrors of war that he, he witnessed firsthand, um, you know, walking into a hospital, seeing a little girl with half her face. The nightmares that came and the nightmares that were specific to him that somehow or other he was doing horrific things. All of that adds up to very deep trauma. And for Ben, it was, how can I go on? And he took a gun and, and he, he thought about killing himself. But instead, he picked up the phone and he talked to somebody. And in that talk, he said that the, there's a Jesus victory that's under your pain. So I have a question for you. 
Have you invited Jesus into your pain? Do you think that he can solve it? Because if you're not inviting him in, that's exactly what you're saying. He can't solve this. Let me assure you, he's experienced every pain that you've ever had. The Bible's very specific on this one point. Uh, you can read it in your Bible. It's in Isaiah chapter 53. He took away all our pain. He, it was all placed on him. He feels it. He knows exactly what you've been through. What he's waiting for you is for you to ask him in, to invite him into that pain so that you can see the Jesus victory that's been there all along, and it's right there underneath your pain. Now, for Ben, he picked up the phone and talked to somebody, and in that, he found hope, and then a process of working through the trauma to the victory that Jesus has for him. If you want to do this, let's do it together right now. Let's invite Jesus in. He's able he will take care of it. There's a reason he's called the balm of Gilead. He's the healer. He wants to heal your deepest emotional wound, anything that's happened to you. He wants to be there for you. Let's pray. Jesus, I come to you, and I know now that you know every hurt that has ever happened to me that you bore it all. And Jesus, if you bore it, that means I don't have to bear it any longer. So Jesus, come in. Come into my pain. Come into my hurt. Come into my innermost being. Come into that knot that's deep within me that I've never let go. Lord, untie it all. Release me from it. Heal me from it, for I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If you want to pick up a phone and call somebody and have them pray for you, encourage you, it's real simple, 1-800-700-7000. We're here for you. Here's a word from Psalms. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. 